That's good. Right. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first. And then let's also read Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, it was good last night to get an, a good overview in terms of what we are doing and why we are spending the time in the book of Isaiah. And last night for me, again, the burden concerning God's judgment uh, is very much on my mind in these days. As we see the Lord's return, as we see that day approaching quickly, and to see that the goal is not just that the Lord would bring down the Father's kingdom, but that we as his people would also grow, mature, and be perfected to become kings and priests to reign together with Christ on this earth. This is why the judgment is so important for us to be qualified. Otherwise, you know, for us to assume that we would be qualified Without any judgment, uh, we are ignorant if we think in those terms. And so this is why it's so good that we spend some time in the second part of Isaiah to see God's judgment upon his people and also God's judgment upon all his enemies. And this morning, uh, in the two morning meetings, we will focus on, firstly, the judgment that God will have concerning the enemies that are external or from without. That will be in the first meeting. And in the second meeting, we will also see what are the internal enemies, the enemies from within. We need to realize that if God's desire is to have his kingdom on this earth and that we all would be qualified to be kings and priests, then we need to also see that someone will definitely oppose this. God's enemies will definitely oppose this. And the goals, the goal, the main goal of all of the external enemies of God is to destroy Zion, to destroy the city of the living God, to destroy Jerusalem, and ultimately to disperse the nation of Israel. This is really important to see. Why is it so important to see? Because, you know, today when we speak about the building up of the church, and churches, if I say the word church, what's the first thing that pops up in your mind? Right? Some, the bride of Christ. Others, the body of Christ. And there are many different definitions that, you might have in your concept regarding the church. This is why the church is just a, a description of the gathering of the, sanct the separated ones. But it's good to see even more specific, what is Jerusalem and what is Zion? Jerusalem and Zion, these are names of places and the names of the city. And with Jerusalem, this is the name of the city of peace. It's the place where God's people gather to worship. That's why in Psalm 122, it says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Right, so Jerusalem is the gathering place for God's people, for them to worship. But then even the more, when we get to Zion, what does Zion mean to us? 
And in Psalm 48, it says, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in his holy mountain. And this is the city of the great king. So when we hear Zion, what should be first and foremost in our minds is this is the city of our great king, meaning where God's throne is, which means it is the kingdom of God. If we don't see the church as the city of the great king, the kingdom of God, and we just think of it as maybe a social gathering, a place of building in a very general way, then we will miss what the enemy is trying to do. <laughs> the enemy wants to destroy God's kingdom. This is why our vision concerning the church needs to be uplifted. We need to get beyond just the word church. We need to realize we are in Zion. And Zion is first and foremost where the throne of God is. And if we see this, and this is before our eyes, then we should realize today, in Matthew 11 it says, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. So that means all of our individual problems, all the little problems that, we make so big in the church. It's not about you against me. It's not about flesh and blood. It's about principalities and powers trying to do everything they can to take down God's kingdom. Because they know, based on the Lord's strategy, it says every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself will not stand. So may the Lord really open our eyes to see what is really at stake. Why is, God, why is God's enemies attacking the church so much? Because this is the very throne of God. This is where God's throne is set up. We need to see this. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll be ignorant. And we would just get mired in our day-to-day -day problems. There's something much greater Right? And, of course, when you read in Isaiah, there are many enemies, external enemies. But this morning, we want to focus on two in particular. In Isaiah 13 and 14, you, you hear of Babylon. Right? And so we will focus this morning a little bit more on specifically Babylon and Tyre. And these two places... When you read in Isaiah, and you also read in Ezekiel, it talks about the king of Babylon and the king of Tyre. And when you read the passages, what you begin to realize is the king, the architect, and the builder of Babylon and Tyre is Satan himself. When you read Isaiah 14, 4, it says, it begins by saying, you will take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say. But then when you get to verse 12, all of a sudden it switches. It says, how, are you, how you have, are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. All of a sudden you see that king of Babylon is really, it alludes or makes direct reference to now being Lucifer. Lucifer, the archangel who was taking care of the earth before he decided he wanted to be equal to God and to rebel against God and ultimately becoming Satan himself. And then in Ezekiel 28, as is describing regarding the king of Tyre, verse 11, it says, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect and beauty. You were in Eden and the garden, the, sorry, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. Now, how did the king of Tyre, the king of Tyre was not there in Eden, <laughs> in the garden of Eden. And now what it's speaking about again is related to Satan himself. 
So we need to begin to see <laughs> Babylon and Tyre, who is the king, who is the architect, who is the ruler over Babylon and Tyre. It is Satan himself. That's why in John chapter 12 it says, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. In 1 John verse, chapter 5, verse 19, it says, We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. We should not be naive who is behind these two places, Babylon and Tyre. It is really Satan himself who is the ruler of this world. Now, why does he use Babylon? Now, Babylon, he already began to use Babylon all the way back in Genesis when you hear about the story of Babel, the Tower of Babel, where God, uh, or, sorry, where the people of the earth, they wanted to build a tower that reaches to the heavens to be like God, proud. And God judged it. And this is where men were confounded with multiple languages. So there was confusion and division. So this is the beginning of Babylon. And then, of course, in the days of the children of Israel, because they were stiff-necked and hardened in heart, they rebelled against God. And eventually, the empire of Babylon came in, destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, and took away God's people into captivity. And again, this is again confusion, division. God's people are in captivity. Well, today, we also need to realize that there is also Babylon in the, in the spiritual sense. And it's described here in Revelation chapter 17. In verse 3, it says, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in pure and s in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a cup, golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. So here in, in Revelation chapter 17, you see Babylon the Great, who is the mother of harlots. This is a whore, a prostitute. Outwardly, the appearance seems to be okay, right? Gilded with purple, scarlet, gold, precious stones, and pearls. Even holding a golden cup. On the outside, there is a, seems to be an okay appearance. But when you go inside and you find out this golden cup is full of abominations, and the filthiness of her fornication. And you also see that she was drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. This is Babylon the Great today. We're not, we don't have so much time to get into all the details of who this person is, but in, some, in short, this, what you see here is the system, the religious system, that we see quite commonly in the Roman Catholicism. And because it's also the mother of harlots, there are many daughters. So her offsprings, many of the denominations that have come out of Roman Catholicism. This is Babylon the Great. But how? How did the, how did the church could become such a whore, such a harlot? How did this, how is this possible? 
And this is why we have to go back to Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Revelation chapters 2 and 3 tells us the development of how the church became Babylon the Great. And in Revelation 2 and 3, you can already begin to see God chastening his church. Last night we talked about this. It's necessary that we as his children be chastened. And when you start going through all of the chastening of the Lord, what became very clear is that all of the things that the Lord had against and all of the things that the Lord hated, these are the very strategy that Satan used in Babylon the Great to destroy the priesthood. How do we become kings and priests? If you're in a religious system that not only discourages you, but prevents you from becoming a priest in the priesthood according to God's word. Right? So like the church in Ephesus, it speaks about, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. The best love. And the Lord wants the, the church there to turn back to do the first or to do the best works. Are we coming back to really keep the Lord's command concerning the matter of the priesthood? The best works. It's the priesthood. Learning to keep the feast, to prepare the offerings, which causes us to be changed and to be perfected. And then yet you see the mixture in the world. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. So there is mixture of the things of the world brought into the church. And then keeping or holding the doctrines of Balaam. Being dependent on paid prophets. Or keeping the works of the Nicolaitans. The clergy laity system. All of this. I mean, it's not just Roman Catholicism. If you look at Christianity to today, you see a hierarchy. All of these things today, it actually prevents us from learning to be trained to become priests. We're always dependent on other people. We like to listen to what people say, listen to the sermon. But what about preparing during the week, laboring to prepare the offerings, the spiritual sacrifices? Right? And eventually you, you get all the way down to, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. For I have, I have not found your works perfect before God. If we are not preparing today... <laughs> From Sunday afternoon to Sunday morning, you know, all the other times except for Sunday morning, <laughs> we might have the name, but we are dead. We may have the name, but we are not yet perfected. Right. How can we get perfected today? And the worst uh, matter of it is the matter of being lukewarm. You're neither hot nor you're cold, right? Because it, you say, in Revel, uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 17, it says, because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. We always say, I know. I know. We know a lot of things. To know the priesthood is one thing, but to practice it, to be trained in the priesthood, is a totally different thing. Right? Because you do need to be perfected. We need to be perfected. And that requires us to turn. That requires us to labor. It requires us to cooperate with the Lord. <laughs> How can you do that if all you say is, yeah, yeah, I know. I already know. <laughs> I still remember someone saying, I, why are we talking about the offerings again? We already know it. I don't know if you've heard that. I've heard that a few times already now in the last three and a half years. Why do you speak about 
keeping the feast. We already know the feast. Do we? <laughs> we may know it, but we might not be keeping it. <laughs> right? We speak a lot about Babylon for others, but we don't realize we ourselves can also fall into the Babylonian ways. This is why even with the church in Philadelphia, the Lord had to call out those to overcome, to hold fast. Right? So we need to get a realization that Satan uses Babylon, the great, this religious system, to keep his people in captivity through confusion and division. Right? Where, and this is the question we should be asking ourselves, where do you find a place which speaks not only about the Lord's coming, but how to prepare for his coming? And how to learn to be perfected in the priesthood according to his word? Where do you find such a place? And where do you find a place that speaks about qualifying? How do you qualify to become kings and priests according to his command? Right, so... The Lord needs to open our eyes to see what is this Babylon the Great. Now, this is the religious system. Then you also have Tyre. And Tyre is about the world of commerce, the system of commerce. We, we realize that Egypt is the world. But Tyre is even more specific. Tyre is all about buying and selling. But not just buying and selling. It's concerning luxurious items. In Ezekiel, it, it, says, it says this. It's very interesting. Chapter 27. And it says, And say to Tyre, you who are situated at the entrance of the sea, merchant of peoples on many coastlands, thus says the Lord God, O Tyre, you have said, I am perfect in beauty. And then you go on. It says, fine embroidered linen. Not just any kind of linen, but it's very fine, embroidered. And when you get to verse 12, it says, Tarsus was your merchant because of your many, what? Luxury goods. And they bartered human lives and vessels of bronze for your merchandise. Means they would pay with their own life. <laughs> bartered. And then they brought ivory tusks and ebony as payment because of your many luxury items. So this is not just a system of commerce. It's a system of commerce focused on luxurious items. You consider today, right? We need a car, right? So we can drive to go to work. But what kind of a car? <laughs> Are we just focused on the car or are we focused on, you know, I need to have that Porsche or Lamborghini or a BMW. Vince's dream, a BMW. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> right? Or it could be something as simple as a handbag, a purse. But no, it's got to be a coach purse. Or I heard this other name I've never heard of before, which... Yes, that one. I don't even know how to pronounce it. <laughs> right? This is just the material items. Right? And then, you know, as parents, we want the best for our children. <laughs> so we want them to go to the best university, an Ivy League. Not just a Cal State, but it's got to be Stanford. Right? Same thing with our homes. Right? It's nice to have a, a roof over your head, but it's got to be in the best place. Newport Beach, in the OC. <laughs> I mean, we laugh, but this is, this is, we have to begin to realize Tyre is a system not only of commerce, but it's a system of commerce regarding luxurious items. The Lord, I mean, sorry, when the Lord was tempted by Satan, in chapter 4 of Matthew, in verse 9, it says, Satan said to the Lord, it says, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Right. 
How is it that you have people making hundreds of millions of dollars today unless they have sold their soul to the devil? And you can already see this now. It's coming out regarding the Hollywood so-called movie stars, the stars. That's why there's this TV show called American Idols. <laughs> movie stars are really idols that you worship. Right? Many of the popular, so-called popular pop music, if you read very carefully, someone forwarded to me a post online, and many of the popular songs make reference to the devil, to worship the devil in a very subtle way. And it's masked. You can't see it because the tune is so catchy. And it's buried in there somewhere. And you don't realize that there's something with the source behind it, the devil. And it's also becoming more and more clear even amongst the sports athletes, the top athletes in all the sports. How is it that they can make the most amazing shots, do the most amazing play on the field? And when I say shots, it's not just limited to the basketball. It could be other sports. But it's starting to come out. When you start taking a look at the Internet, you realize behind all of that is because they have also given themselves to the worship of the devil. The Luciferians, the Illuminatis. It's becoming more and more open in what is their real source. Right, so we need to see this. If you give yourself to all of the riches and the luxurious items to the world, in the end, you will sell your soul to the devil. That's why. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul says to Timothy, verse 9 of chapter 6, it says, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which draw, drown men in destruction and perdition. You really consider this in your daily life. What is it really that we're working for? You want a bigger house? You want more cars? Okay, maybe you want a second vacation home. You want to have the best for your children. And, and before you know, you're focused or you're distracted in making money. Borrowing more money so that you can spend more. And eventually what happens? You become what? You become anxious. You become worried. You become nervous. And you think about it all the time. Well, what you be have become is you become enslaved in this system of commerce for luxury items. This is the strategy of the devil. And we should not underestimate the influence and the power of this world. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, it says, For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. So we shouldn't just think that, well, well we're here in the church, we're here coming to the Lord's Day or conferences, that the world cannot influence you and enslave you in such a way. Right? And that's why the Lord even warns the disciples in Luke 21, verse 34. It says, but take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life. And that day come on you unexpectedly, for it will come as a snare. It's not so obvious. A snare is subtle. You stick your head through the snare to get that wonderful piece of food, and then the snare goes zap, and it hangs you, and you're left hanging there struggling to get out of it. But in this case, 
for it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Right? You're so caught up, and all of a sudden, the peace treaty is signed. <laughs> then do we, have, do we wake up, or are we still wrapped up with the cares of this life? Right? So we need to be very we need to be very clear, brothers and sisters. What is it that we're dealing with here? What the enemy has built a system, a, re, a system of religion and a system of commerce. And both are targeted to destroy Zion. Prevents us from being perfected and to be trained up as this royal and holy priesthood. This is why the Lord says in Revelation 18, 4, it says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. Brothers and sisters, may we all come out of her. <laughs> okay, today we might not be meeting in Roman Catholicism. We may not be in these major denominations or mega churches. But here today, we also could fall into the same situation. I still remember when we gave that gospel presentation regarding the matter of God's judgment of Babylon. That was on a Friday night. Then we come on the Lord's Day and we gather for the feast. And what happened? It was an exercise, right? Was it an exercise or was it a struggle to keep the feast? Because we also have that, there is the possibility for us to fall in that way. Right? So to come out of her, what does that really mean? That means today, even the more, we should focus on keeping the feast. Be willing to be trained in the priesthood to reach the goal. Right? And when we see one another, when we gather together, exhort one another. Don't just come for the sake of meeting. <laughs> Right In Hebrews 10.25, it says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but when you come together, what do you do? Exhort one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. So when we gather on the Lord's Day, may we really encourage, exhort, strongly urge each other. We need to keep the feast. And during the week, Prepare. And not be distracted, right? So this is the one part in focusing to come out of her. But the other part is we need to then during the week prepare. Right? When I say don't be caught up with the cares of this life, I'm not saying that now you don't work or you just do terrible on your job. I'm not saying that you need to not care for your children. But we need to begin to see what is the proper care. The Lord said in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, it says, For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? So it's not that we're weighed down or distracted with caring for the family and things like that, but how is it that we're doing it? Are we doing it with our own focus on the material things of the world, or are we doing it with the view of the kingdom? That's why the Lord says, seek first. In Matthew 6, 33, it says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. Amen. So everything that we do in our daily life, if we learn to be exercised, to walk by the Spirit, and to practically see all of our daily life as opportunities for the Lord to perfect us. Whether it's by keeping the feast or preparing the offerings. Then this is how the Lord can prepare us. And cause change in our lives. And ultimately to qualify us. Right? So do not be distracted. That's why in 1 Timothy 6 says... Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. 
May we all be exercised in such a way. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Right? But if we don't do this, <laughs> then we have to remember Isaiah spoke about the judgment upon Babylon. It also spoke about the judgment upon Tyre. It's not just for that day, but it's also for the day when we get to the great day of God's wrath. That's why in Revelation 14, 8, it says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And when you get to chapter 18, it goes into much more detail. But the phrases that I highlighted was quite significant. When it comes to the destruction of Babylon, the great, verse 8 of chapter 18, it says, Therefore, her plagues will come in one day. Not one month, not one year. One day. Death and mourning and famine. She will be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. And another phrase, for in one hour, such great riches came to nothing. And that was replicated again, set, repeated again in verse 19. It says, for in one hour, she is made desolate. That means if we are still not coming out of Babylon the Great, if we are still so focused on building up all of the luxurious items, then definitely, <laughs> if we don't come out of her, then we will also share in this judgment on Babylon. And it will be a double portion. All that you're working for, can you imagine, Mercy, your entire 401k plan, your portfolio that you carefully managed to grow into this wonderful nest egg for you to retire, gone in one hour. How would you feel? <laughs> Don't answer. I'm just saying, I mean, if all our hope is in that, then when that day, that day of judgment comes and everything goes to nothing in one hour, are we going to be like the merchants there who are mourning and weeping? Or will we be like this in verse 20? It says, Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. So will we be mourning? Oh, my cars are all gone. Or will we be rejoicing together at the throne? Right? Remember, the day this world is passing away. And this is why in 2 Peter chapter 3, it says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in a night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it, the earth and the works that are in it, will be burned up. So this is God's judgment on Babylon and Tyre. And we need to see, again, the goal, Satan's goal with Babylon and Tyre is to destroy Zion. It's to destroy God's kingdom today. We, not, we, we should not be naive, nor should we be ignorant. And may we respond to the Lord to come out of her and begin to really focus on what needs to be taken care of at hand today, that we would be trained up in the holy and royal priesthood. And that, if we do this, and if we are faithful to the Lord in such a way, then this will qualify us and get us ready for his coming.